My name is Lauren Smith and I'm a PhD candidate uh, at UCLA uh, in the Ecology and Evolutionary Biology Department. And today I will be talking about one of my research objectives, which is to compare a key ecosystem function, resource subsidies, provided by invasive Sargassum honori and native Macrocystis pyrifera rack. I thought that I would give a little bit about me before I got too far into it. Um, I was gonna say I grew up not too far away, but I guess I don't know where everyone is since we're doing this on Zoom. Um, but I grew up in Dana Point, California. I'm the oldest of three kids and we spent a lot of time at the beach and I quickly developed a love and passion for the ocean. And by high school, I was pretty sure that I wanted to study marine ecology. I had the wonderful opportunity of doing that at UC Santa Cruz. Um, it's in a prime location for studying marine ecology because they have a marine lab that's right on the ocean. And they have classes with like, I guess titles I couldn't even really believe were titles of classes at the time. Um, marine mammals, coastal conservation, marine botany, kelp forest ecology. And it was there that I had the opportunity to become a scientific scuba diver, um, which is a skill that I use today to conduct my research. And I had the um, opportunity as well to actually work at one of the labs, which was really exciting. Um, I spent two years working with the Coastal Conservation Action Lab, and this was my first introduction to invasive species. So while I was there, um, their goal was to create uh, what is now online and accessible to everyone, the Threatened Island Biodiversity Database. And it prioritizes islands for invasive species eradications, um, which is pretty neat. So it looks at all endangered and critically endangered island breeding vertebrates and their threats on islands, including invasive species. And then um, island conservation uses that data to eradicate species on islands to preserve endangered and uh, critically endangered species. This is also when I got my first glimpse into graduate school and thought that that was something that I, was, I would be interested in. Um, when I left Santa Cruz, I took some time off. Before going into graduate school, I took about four years off and I worked a lot of different jobs. I'm just gonna talk about one of them, but I worked at Sport Chalet, the Ritz Carlton for a computer company. I was kind of all over the map. Um, but one of the jobs that I really loved was working for Laguna Ocean Foundation as a tide pool educator, which is kind of a fancy way of saying that I showed visitors around the tide pools. And it was during this time that I really started thinking about going back to graduate school. And I started noticing that a bunch of things had changed in these tide pools that I grew up around and started thinking about questions that I might want to ask once I reached graduate school. So the first was sea star wasting disease. Um, the tide pools I worked at got hit pretty hard in 2013. Um, and we lost all the sea stars, which was really devastating um, for a number of reasons. And one of the biggest was it's really crushing to tell a kid that you can't help them find a sea star. <laughs> Um, when they've traveled all the way from Minnesota or something to, to see that specifically. Um, but also just not good for the ecosystem in general. Um, we had a lot of pelagic red crabs um, pushed in on shore from warm water. This was something I hadn't seen growing up, um, but happened I think twice while I worked for Laguna Ocean Foundation and has happened a number of times since. Um, the sea urchins also got a disease. It was a waste, a balding disease. Um, so they lost all their spines, which made them very vulnerable to aerial predators like seagulls. And then the last one was a new species that I'd never seen before. Um, and that actually turned out to be Sargassum honori. I started doing some research on it and um, some readings, which um, was more difficult at the time because I didn't have access to a university's library but kind of started learning about the species and thinking it was something that I'd want to study um, in graduate school. And that's how I arrived at UCLA in 2016. Since then, I've spent the past two summers and the past two winters on Catalina Island studying invasive Sargassum honori. Um, before I jump straight into Sargassum, I just want to talk about why we should care about invasive species. So, they are reshaping ecosystems worldwide. They've led to a loss of biodiversity. Here you can see, this is an island in Mexico. And on this side of the island, you have, um, no, you have invasive goats. And on this side of the island, you have no invasive goats. 
um, they've led to a loss of species. So um, of species with known causes of extinctions, invasive species are solely responsible for 20% of, um, of extinctions and um, they're implicated in 54% of extinction losses. A loss of ecosystem services. Uh, so that's anything that kind of we benefit from in the environment. So this is a picture of invasive quagga mussels that have fouled a boat propeller. A loss of ecosystem function. Uh, so this is an image of kudzu, which has um, reduced the number of habitat types in this area, making them all the same. And invasive species interact with other um, things going on in our environment, such as human-induced climate change. Um, so human-induced climate change alters environments. Uh, this can open up space for invasive species to, to move into. They can facilitate species expansions. So we are seeing that in Florida as the mangrove forests slowly march north. Um, and human-induced climate change interacts with existing stressors, compounding or increasing them to create large physical disturbances. And a lot of times invasive species are able to use those physical disturbances as an opportunity to move into a new area and expand quickly. So what actually is an invasive species? Um, first, it's a species that has been introduced to a novel environment. And so here I've built a Caribbean reef and I'm introducing a lionfish. It has to successfully expand into that new habitat. So now we have a lot of lionfish. And then last, they have to cause economic or environmental harm. So in this case, the lionfish eats the reef fish and they have no natural predators. Too many minuses. <laughs> Slow. Okay. So the study species that I am studying, as I've introduced already, is Sargassum honori. Um, and it's invasive in California and is having um, potentially negative impacts on an ecologically and important, economically important fish, the kelp bass, because they will not breed in the Sargassum honori, only in um, kelp forests. It arrived in Southern California in 2003 in Long Beach Harbor. It was likely introduced via shipping vessels. Within three years, it was found on three locations on Santa, Santa Catalina Island. Since that time, it has spread over 750 kilometers from Santa Barbara to Isla Natividad, although likely it has spread farther. Um, every couple of months, I check different citizen science apps like iNaturalist to see um, where Sargassum is, and I've seen a number of um, reports in Monterey and Santa Cruz counties. So likely it is moving into central and northern California. Uh, Sargassum honori is an annual species, so it has its entire life cycle in one year. It starts growing and is recruit size at the end of summer, and it moves into being sexually mature during the winter. And then once it, um, once it has reproduced, it, then it starts to senesce and die um, in the spring. It grows to be about three meters in height. It is particularly well suited to invade because it is highly fecund. It is also capable of self-fertilization. There is a lot of concern that Sargassum honori is spreading into areas that are historically dominated by kelp forests. In Southern California, our kelp forests are characterized by cold nutrient-rich waters. The dominant species is Macrocystis pyrifera which is perennial. Um, I think it lives to be about seven years, um, or it can live to be about seven years. It grows to be up to 30 meters, and so it adds very different um, dynamics to the forest than something like sargassum that can only grow to three meters. And it starts to decline at 20 degrees Celsius. So my question um, is, I wanna look at comparing a key ecosystem function resource subsidies uh, that are provided by the invasive Sargassum honori and the native Macrocystis pyrifera. And over the next few slides, I um, hope to convince you of why I'm doing this, explain where I'm doing this, and describe how I am doing this. So why is beach rack important? Um, 
When algae washes on shore, it provides an important resource. If you think about a beach without any algae on it, um, it's very flat and kind of a desolate place. There's not a lot of relief. And so when algae washes on shore, it adds habitat, so it gives, um, especially invertebrates, a safe place to live. Um, it protects them from the sun. And um, there's like this interstitial space in between. They can move around. And then it also provides trophic support. Um, and so that might look something like this, where you have the algae on the beach and it has started to decay. And it is being consumed as it decays by uh, bugs. So I saw a lot of like amphipods and isopods, beetles, flies. Those things are eaten by birds or maybe lizards. Um, and then uh, importantly, the birds take that and then they um, go into the terrestrial community and um, they fertilize uh, the terrestrial community with what they've eaten from um, the kelp racks. And so it's important nutrient resource that comes in from the ocean and is transitioned into terrestrial communities. Currently, Sargassum horneri is washing up along the coast as beach rack. Um, it's often mixed in with uh, kelp, but in some places it's the dominant um, rack on the beach. And I did this work, as you can imagine, in California, specifically on Catalina. Intertidal and subtidal communities in Southern California have been subject to multiple invasions, at least 13 algal species, and provide a model system for assessing their causes, mechanisms, and impacts. And then Catalina is a great place to study it because it's been particularly impacted by Sargassum horneri. In some locations, um, Sargassum horneri has become the primary placeholder and has for, it can form dense monocultures like this one. And so I conducted my experiment on the leeward side of the island, um, on this side, at the campground um, at Two Harbors um, in Little Fisherman's Cove. So this is how I did it. I'm gonna say it all with words and then walk through it with pictures. So hopefully that'll be clear. Um, it's a two-factor field experiment. So the two factors are algal species, which were Sargassum horneri and Macrocystis pyrifera, and time. So I took data on day one, day three, day nine, and day 21. I put out 40 experimental racks and at each time point collected five of each species. Um, they were randomly placed along the rack line, and the response variables are total number of organisms and species diversity. And I also planned on monitoring bird activity, but after spending many hours watching, I saw no birds interact with the rack, which sometimes happens in science. Your best laid plans don't always work out. Um, and so I might do some bird studies on um, the mainland of California and the rack without setting out experimental racks, do it with natural racks that are already there. So what did this look like in the field? This is me and my dive buddy Emily and we're collecting giant bags of kelp and sargassum. Uh, we had permission to take 15 um, stipes of kelp and about 20 adult sargassum. Um, so we went and scuba dove for those. Um, and then normally, when we do experiments in the field, we kind of have a process for getting a standardized wet weight of the algae. And that looks like taking the algae, we put it into nylons, um, and then we um, put it through a low velocity centrifuge to get a, a wet weight. Um, low velocity centrifuges also are salad spinners. Um, so we basically would make a nice seaweed salad, and then we'd weigh it. Um, but as you can imagine, um, 15 stipes of kelp is a little big to put into a nylon. And so we had to replace three parts of my uh, circle. And instead we used large mesh bags and we swung them over our heads for one minute. And then uh, we used a fish scale to weigh them um, until they were all the same weight. And then we made these kind of like kelp packets and sargassum packets. So it's um, wrapped in trellis netting and uh, the ends are all zip tied together. And then we took those out to the beach. So this is what it looked like. This is, this is uh, Little Fisherman's Cove. And um, these are like the randomization of what the racks would be. They're all about 1.5 meters apart. And the way that we put them in was we dug like 45 two foot holes 
and we put sand anchors in, which are uh, blocks of wood with a hole drilled in the middle and a rope tied through it. Um, and then we affixed all of the racks that we'd made uh, to those ropes. So you can see them here, just going down the line. Um, and then on day one, day three, day nine, and day 21, I collected 10 racks total, five of each species. So this is what they look like in the beginning, um, all kind of luscious. And then this is more what they look like by the end, kind of sad. Um, and throughout the process, um, I did a couple of things. So I wanted to know not just um, what like amphipods and isopods were in them, but also flies. And so I put out petri dishes that were covered in tanglefoot just right above um, the algae and um, would leave them out for a number of hours and then come through and collect all of the flies that were on it from each species. And then I also tried, so we, we caught some flies out of the way. So this is, we needed, we needed a way to get the algae back. And so what I did was I bagged it um, in trash bags and you can see here, it'll play. There's a lot of flies that I caught in there as well. And so I needed a way for them not to escape while they were um, counted. And so I ended up freezing the bags uh, for 24 hours. And then once the algae was frozen, I put it into filtered water in my cooler and I um, would kind of move it around, make sure I was getting all the bugs off of it and then pour that water through a nylon. Um, and that's what this is here. So it's like a caterpillar that I found. And then um, this is what it looked like. So this is uh, sargassum um, findings. So these are all kelp flies. And then these are all amphipods. Um, so caught quite a few. These are what amphipods look like in the wild. And I um, haven't finished um, because uh, I, the, the day I collected my last rack, so day 21, um, was the day that UCLA shut down. And so I'm excited to um, go back once we're open again and actually look and see what kind of amphipods I got and what kind of bugs. But what I do know is that I was surprised by the results. I expected that because kelp is native, that the invertebrates would like that better, that it would be a better resource for them, not only for habitat, but for food. And that is not what I found, at least in terms of volume. Um, it took me sometimes twice as long, sometimes two and a half times as long to go through one sargassum rack as it did to go through a kelp rack. Um, so the sargassum, it would be full of amphipods and bugs, and the kelp would have like 20 things in it, and that would be it. And so I was pretty surprised by that result. Um, in the future, um, I plan on identifying the invertebrates that we found and comparing the species diversity as well as the total number of organisms. And then I also, you can see here, I decided to dry the racks out. Um, it was a very smelly process, um, but we dried the whole racks and we also dried smaller samples of it. And I plan on sending that out for nutrient analysis because I I'm trying to figure out what about the sargassum is different from the kelp that makes it a better habitat. Um, and possibly it could be nutrients. Um, likely, I think it's the interstitial space between. I think sargassum is tighter um, and it has kind of more small branches and small leaves. And so maybe that offers more protection than kelp, which is a little bit more spread out. And so that's what I've done so far. Um, and with that, I will thank my advisor, Dr. Peggy Fong, the entire staff at the UC Wrigley um, Institute, my dive buddy, Emily Reisner, my lab mate, Shana, who came out and dug a lot of holes with us, and the rest of the Fong lab, as well as my funding sources. Thank you.